this lecture, we are going to be focusing on the changing role of man from ancient Greece, where we've been spending most of our time looking at mythology and the Iliad, through the Renaissance. And again, remember, we are focusing mainly on the Western world. To get recap some of where we are coming from, in Greece, remember this is when we talk about classicalism, we're talking about ancient Greece and ancient Rome. In Greece, the idea was that man was not given credit for creativity. According to Aristotle and Plato, that man just mimicked. Um, in fact, there wasn't even a Greek word for creativity. The word was mimesis, which means to mimic. Plato believed in a higher level of ideals, meaning that, taken the, the example of a perfect circle, that the idea of a perfect circle existed not in this plane, but on another plane. And anything we did in this plane to try to recreate that per perfect circle was at best a copy or mimicking it. And then the artists he believed were very dangerous because they at best were copying this copy. And so he didn't think the artists were to be trusted because in a way he saw them as liars. This idea continues with Aristotle. However, he was not as, I guess, pessimistic maybe as Plato was, and he thought there's nothing wrong with mimicking. That's how we as humans learn. Think of the language you speak. Why do you speak that language? Probably because it's what you grew up listening to, and then you began to mimic others. The ideas of uh, Greek classicalism is, again, remember this idea of order, balance, clean line, um, idealization, simplicity, and grace within the works. And you can see that through the architecture here, which is the Parthenon. What's very interesting about the Parthenon, though, is we see very clean, ordered lines, it's balanced, it's symmetrical, when in fact the Parthenon is actually an optical illusion. There's pretty much not a straight line within the building. The Greeks understood how the human eye saw this, and most of this is an optical illusion. The columns running north and south actually bow out more towards the center. Why? Because if they were perfectly straight, from a distance the human eye would add oh, see them with a curve. However, with this kind of bowed out middle, from a distance, the human eye sees them as perfectly straight. This is the same as for the horizontal lines. If you were standing at one end of the Parthenon and somebody else was standing at the other end, if they took a book and set it down by their feet, you would not be able to see that. Again, this is that optical illusion. From a distance, it appears perfectly straight, but in reality, it's not. We then move to Roman classicalism. Roman classicalism greatly inspired by the Greeks. We're going to see much of the Greek and Hellenistic influence in the works, especially the architecture. Um, in sculpture, we're going to see this, where the Greeks try to show the idealized perfection of man. Um, take sculpture such as the discus thrower, where we would look at it and we wouldn't know who that individual was. It's not like we would say, oh, it's LeBron, um, but we would know it was the idealized form. It was the best form of man. Roman imperialism took some of those same ideas, however, they made it a little more individualistic. For example, here you have the sculpture of Augustus. And here what happens is he has the idealized body, but the sculptor puts Augustus' face on it, and also the Roman clothing. We can see on the bottom, Cupid is attached to him, linking the emperor with the gods. And we see this again within the architecture, clearly inspired by the Greek, but probably the most important invention of Roman architecture is the arch. The arch allows for much more open spaces. We can have open hallways, open buildings, and we can have, as you see here in the Colosseum, very open window spacings. Um, arches, when you think about it, when you put them all together and form a circle, creates a dome. And the domes were able to have buildings with these massive open areas where we didn't have before. However, in the Roman world, again, creativity is still not given credit to man. It's still either copying or some inspiration from the gods. And we're going to see this idea continue to the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages was a time period um, when we have the fall of Rome, and what happens is that the Christian church becomes the dominant source um, of all aspects of life in the Western world. 
The term the Middle Ages actually comes from the people in the Renaissance, and the reason they called the Middle Ages the Middle Ages is they considered it as a time when not really anything very important happened. Now, we know that's not fair, that there were advancements in art and technology, but not a lot, um, especially when we're going to compare it to the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and later on. In the Middle Ages, the role of man changed somewhat in the idea of creativity. Instead of creativity being a, a the idea of copying, the idea of creativity now became as divine inspiration. That artists were people who were more conduits of the divine inspiration, and then they would create the work. They were not given credit for it as their own ideas. And we're going to see this church influence in all aspects of the Middle Ages, from painting, sculpture, uh, architecture, the great cathedrals that are going to be built, to music, even to the literature. Probably the most popular piece of literature from the Middle Ages would be the Divine Comedy of Dante, and this was actually in the late Middle Ages. And this is actually exploring the role of the church and the role of man. And it's made of two separate work, three separate works, the Infergo, the Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. When we put them all together, it's the Divine Comedy. And what we're going to begin to see, especially towards the late Middle Ages, is we're going to start seeing this questioning, this questioning of the church's influence. And we're definitely going to see that at the end of the Middle Ages, where we go into what's called the Gothic style. This is still considered late Middle Ages. It's about the mid-12th century until the Renaissance. It began in France, and again, the term Gothic was coined by those in the Renaissance because it was synonymous to barbaric. However, many of us would not think of the Gothic as barbaric. The Gothic architecture, heavily influenced by the church, in fact, it was created by Abbot Suge, and what he believed was that by the light coming in through these great, great cathedrals that were created and these massive stained glass windows, that light coming in was how an individual would feel and know God's love. One of the most important inventions of Gothic architecture is the Gothic arch. Take the Roman arch and bring it to a point. And you can see that in some of the windows here. And then also we have the flying buttresses. These are the support system you see on the outside of the cathedral. This way you could have these very tall, very open cathedrals inside where the light could come through and it was open and airy, yet they were supported by the flying buttresses on the back. If you would, there's a YouTube video here, which is um, just pretty short, a couple minutes, and it talks about the transition from the Gothic world into the Renaissance. And then the Renaissance, this is where we're going to start to see a very cha uh, change in the role of man. The Renaissance, it's a little bit of a squishy date. It's about 1400 to 1500, and this is the early Renaissance. And what this is, is Renaissance is, many of us know it means rebirth. But rebirth of what? The Renaissance was a rebirth of the ideals of classic Greek and Rome. What had happened during the Middle Ages after the sack of Rome, many of the ancient texts were lost. However, luckily for all of us now, many of these were preserved and saved in the Middle East, in the Byzantine world. And what happens in the Renaissance with travel and discovery, these texts are rediscovered. And so that's where we're going to see again this classical ideas of ancient Greece and ancient Rome come to life in the Renaissance. Florence, Italy was considered the starting point of the Renaissance. In fact, they called themselves the New Athens, hearkening back to the Greek uh, greatness of Greece. And what we're going to see here is this changing role in the role of man again. Remember we had at first creativity was more seen as mimicking. In the medieval, it was seen as divine inspiration. Well, what happens in the Renaissance is we're going to start to see more and more of a shift away from the church. And man is going to turn more for himself to the answers of the world. And we're going to see this reflected in the artwork. And you can see it clearly in the work here. This is, the work is known as the Tribute Money, 1425, and it is a fresco. And this is a panel as a, a part of um, a series of frescoes, meaning that it tells us stories each individual scene is a panel. 
And what this one focuses on, it's on the cycle of the cycle of the life of St. Peter. And this was painted by Macaccio, and it's in the Bronicai Chapel in Santa Maria della Carmine in Florence. And in this work, we are going to see different elements that point to this new idea of the role of man and how man's perception on the world has changed. Within the work, we can see both the use of linear and atmospheric perspective to give it a much more natural, realistic look. The same with the three, the how the men are depicted. In the medieval, we would have what was called stacking, that if we had a group of people together like this, we would want to see everybody. And so it would be like one person painted, and then the next would almost be on their shoulders, on their shoulders. That way we could see everybody. Well, that was not a realistic depiction. Here you can see Mikasio has clearly depicted them realistically. When we have a group of individuals together, we see who's in front, and our view of those who are in back are blocked, and that's how what we see here. We also see a realistic depiction of the clothing that is worn. We see more detail and depth in it. And then also what's interesting in this is that this single panel contains actually three scenes of the same story. And with this, with the tribute money, what we have is in the middle, we see the tax collector has come and he wants the tax so they can enter the temple. Well, they don't have any money, and you can see in the moment this is where Jesus in the center with the red and blue robe is pointing to St. Peter in the orangish, um, orangish red and blue. And he's telling him, okay, go over to the water and catch a fish. And so on the left, you can see St. Peter in the water getting the fish. When he opens up the fish's mouth, there's the money that they need. So then on the right, you see him paying the tribute money so they can go into the temple. Here, also, again, with use of perspective, if you look at the building on the right, this is what's called foreshortening, and it's a technique used in perspective to create the illusion of an object receding strongly into the distance in the background, again, making the figure seem much more realistic. In the early Renaissance, we saw this goal was now to create things as they actually were, as they actually appeared. Now, this wasn't true for all works. We can see here this is Botticelli's La Primavera, or Spring, from 1482. And in this work, he is not as concerned with realistic perspective. However, he's using the use of allegory. So the subject matter here is very based off of Greek, um, a Greek myth. That's, it's the coming of spring, and we see spring in the right foreground, she's the one with all the flowers on her. But the idea with this is an allegory. Allegory means it represents something else. And so this is linked actually to the ideal of Mary, and Mary in the idea of rebirth, and with the, the purity of the work. Now what's also interesting at this time, in the Renaissance, we have very, very importantly the development of oil paints. In the 15th century, Flemish painters developed oil paints. And what happens in oil paints is it helps the artist to achieve a level of realism and perspective unlike they were able to before this time. Why? Oil paints uh, dried much slower. If you've ever painted with them, they take forever to dry. However, this allowed for colors to be blended on the canvas, changes to be made, and what happens, it was also able to allow them to enhance the chiaroscuro, meaning the light and shade, to help develop both perspective and detailed and realism within the works themselves. You can also see this in Jan van Eyck's The Arnolfini Marriage or Giovanni Arnolfini and His Bride. This is from 1434. Now here, this is painted with oil paints, and you can see the richness of the colors that we haven't seen before. What's also interesting within this work is we're actually looking at these two individuals seem wealthy, and they are, and there's different items around the room that tell us that. When we look at their clothing, very richly detailed, um, his cape is fur-lined. If you look on her dress, the detailing and the texture within the fabric shows how rich it is. Uh, if you look in the background, 
There appears to be a canopy bed, which would make us think that we are in their bedroom, when in fact we're not. Canopy beds were kind of seen as a status symbol of the time. Um, only the wealthy could have them, and many people would put them in their main room so other people visiting could see them and know they had them. We also see on the left in the window, you see the oranges. These fruits would be something that would be very hard to get, so again, only the wealthy could have them. The elaborate chandelier hanging up also alludes to the wealth. The shoes on the left-hand side um, are foreign, and they point to travel and trade. And then we also see the mirror in the background. And we'll talk about the mirror here more in a little bit. Um, but why all these status symbols of wealth? These are things we've seen before, but it's so important in this because Arnolfini was actually a merchant. And this is reflecting the rise of a middle class or of the wealthy merchant class who worked for their money. Also what's interesting about this is again the role of creativity and the role of the artist. What happens here is Jan van Eyck represents himself two different times within the work. If we look in the mirror, this is actually what's called a double portrait. In a close-up of the mirror, you can actually see the backs of the two people um, that are painted, but we actually see the artist himself. This literally, he makes himself part of the work. And what's going on here, this has been contested whether it's actually a marriage ceremony or an engagement. Some people, you may think she is pregnant. She is actually not. Um, this was the style of the time. Women would often add padding and slump so that this, this would be the desired silhouette. And we see that within the work. So what happens here is Van Eyck is no longer just a technician. He is not there because of divine inspiration. He's not there because he's mimicking. But he is actually a witness to this legal contract to this event. And then if you look closely in the back, over the mirror there appears to be writing on the wall, and there is. Van Eyck actually wrote, the translation of this is, Jan Van Eyck was here, 1434. Again, letting the viewer know in two different ways the role of the artist, and the artist as witness, not just technician. Now we're also going to see um, the church is being challenged more within the Renaissance. And you can see that in work such as this by Albrecht Durer. This is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, 1497 to 98, and this is a woodcut. Now here we see the medieval superstition, right? The myth of the Four Horsemen, death, famine, war, and plague, and they're trampling humanity. However, what Durer has also put in there, it's showing the fall of the church. Because what's happening is that corruption in the church is being pointed out, um, eventually will lead to the Protestant Reformation. But if you look in the lower left-hand corner, the figure that is being trampled by the four horsemen is actually a bishop, a bishop being trampled to death. And again, it's supposed to show the fall of the church also. Within this, we can see the realistic depiction of um, the characters and the realistic use of perspective. Now this continues in the sculpture, and we're going to see that very clearly in the figure on the left. This is Donatello's David. Um, it's the David of the early Renaissance. And what he is showing here, um, Donatello was considered the greatest sculptor of the time, and this David was actually the first freestanding nude sculptor since classical time. This was made um, from bronze. And the moment that he's capturing here, we know David is already victorious. How do we know? Because he's actually standing on the head of Goliath. You can see that down at the bottom. Now look at this David and think how would you describe him? Most people tend to think he's much more feminine. He seems to have softer, softer, curving lines, and he appears young. Usually with young males appear more feminine. And this was done very intentionally because remember, in the early Renaissance, the artists wanted to capture things as they actually were. And David, as he's described in the biblical story, was described as a beautiful youth. In the story, he also throws off his armor because it's too cumbersome. That's why he's standing here in the nude with only the boots and the hat on. So Donatello, sticking to the early Renaissance ideal, again, wants to show David as he actually was.
And then we're going to see that continue in the literature of the time and in the architecture of the time. The architecture of the time is going to differ from the medieval in three ways. We're going to see more of a revival of the classical models, the Greek and the Roman. We're going to see application of non-structural decorative elements, meaning unlike the flying buttresses of the Gothic, which were beautiful, but they were there to hold the walls up, we're going to see those um, things like that be there, but not just for structural reasons, but purely decorative. And then, along with the flying buttresses, we're going to see the outer expression change, meaning that we're going to have advances in technology, and so the buildings are going to be able to support themselves without this large external um, support system. And what you're looking at here, this is uh, actually Philip Bru Phil Filippo Brunicelli's um, The Florence Cathedral, or the, du the Duomo. All right, now we're going to shift to the High Renaissance. And what we're going to see in the High Renaissance, this is 1495 to about 1527. Um, the reason why 1527 is often seen as the ending date of the High Renaissance is because that is when Spain actually sacks Rome. In the High Renaissance, the, shift fo um, the focus shifts from Florence to Rome. And we're going to see this is because you're going to have the church itself with um, goes on a large art building campaign and an idea of trying to get people to come back into the church. In 1517, we have the Protestant Reformation. And this is where, mostly led by Martin Luther, and what he was challenging was the church's authority and their rule. And what he does is he actually tacks his 95 theses onto the door of Wittenberg Cathedral. And he was challenging the role of the church. Um, part of it was based off of corruption, especially the buying of indulgences that was very prevalent of the time. What this would be were if you would commit a sin, you would go to church, you would confess your sins, and you would be given some sort of penance to make up for that. Well, what happened was this idea developed, well, instead of doing penance, you could actually buy forgiveness by buying an indulgence. So you can see the wealthy were able to do this. And you probably can figure out this led to corruption within the church. Um, this is the time, you know, think of like Robin Hood. This is around that time period. And so Martin Luther is challenging this ideal. He's also challenging the role of the Pope. The Pope is the head of the Catholic Church. And what happens at this time period is that the Pope began to be seen as the voice of God. That if the Pope spoke, it was as if God himself, herself, had spoken. Well, what happens in the Protestant Reformation is that Martin Luther says that was never the intention of the original text. That the Pope is the head of the, of the church, but the Pope is a man. The Pope is not God and is therefore not the voice of God. And so this was another thing that was challenged within the Protestant Reformation. And because of this, we see probably the largest split within the church. Well, what this leads to is that it leads to um, the church putting on a great campaign to bring people back into the church. And they do this by creating many artworks. Well, what we're going to see in the High Renaissance is we are going to see even more of a return to classical ideals of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, especially the idealized form. And what's also interesting in the High Renaissance is that we found this ideal within the mathematical form. So if you look at this image here, this is by Raphael, and this is the Alba Madonna, 1510, and it is in oil. Here we're going to see the treatment again, much more lifelike, much more realistic. In this moment, we see Madonna, the baby Jesus, and baby John the Baptist in a field. Yet you can see here the mathematical portions of it. Not only is it cut, the canvas cut in the circle, but if you can see here an equilateral triangle. If we go from the back left hip of John the Baptist, go to the top of Mary's head, follow the line down her shoulder, and then across you see an equilateral triangle. And that's how we see this mathematical fluence influence in the works. Now what we also see is part of the church trying to bring more people back in with this great um, artistic campaign. And we see that very clearly in St. Peter's Basilica, which you see here. Um, what happens during this time period, this is the time period where 
Um, the Sistine Chapel is being created by Pope Sistus. Uh, Pope Sistus V, I'm sorry, the fourth, commissioned the Sistine Chapel, and then he very humbly named it after himself. We can see the walls are painted per by Peruguino and Botticelli, and then later Michelangelo was called to Rome to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The last judgment that he painted is actually not until later in his life, and we'll talk about that more. But with St. Peter's Basilica, um, Michelangelo himself actually became the chief architect after he was criticizing the original plans. However, he said the plan of it was clear and pure and full of life, and it represented truth. It was completed in May of 1590, but total completion of the entire square was not done until 1614. And so we're also going to see here um, within the Vatican many of these ideals of the High Renaissance. The High Renaissance is seen as the high point in Renaissance art. Again, a return to the Greek ideal of the idealized form, and it sought to capture these ideas of classic art, but not to simply copy them. The belief was that a harmonious universe was found within perfect order, and this perfect order was found through composition of mathematics, meaning mathematical order and composition was closed, bringing your eye into the center of the work. Um, this was also a time of continued discovery. Nicholas Copernicus is working at this time and published um, the On the Revolutions of Celestial Bodies in 1543, where he claimed the Earth and other planets result, revolved around a sun. You have to remember at this point in time, we live in a geocentric universe. The idea was that the Earth was the center of the universe and everything else revolved around it. And this was the idea supported by the church, meaning God had planned it this way. We also see this is a time of Francis Bacon, who advocated for scientific exploration and in fact created the scientific method. And Bacon claimed that you needed actual observations to be made and that hypothesis should be tested and proved, and he no longer wanted people to rely on things just on blind faith, meaning following things the way they've always been, or that the church has told you, that you actually need to go out and experiment this. And now we're going to see these ideas um, in the works of Raphael, 1483 to 1520. Um, he actually died young at the age of 37. He became very famous for his paintings of Madonna and Child, which we saw earlier. Um, and you're going to see the different ones, like the Madonna Alba that we, uh, Alba Madonna that we already looked at. However, what we're looking at here is in 1508, Pope Julius II commissioned him to paint frescoes within the Vatican Palace. And his most famous are in the Stanza della Signatoria, which means the room of the signature. It literally was the room where the important documents were signed. And his most famous work from this fresco series is the one you see here. This is a School of Athens, 1510 to 1511. It's also a fresco. And so what he's showing here is he's showing respect for the ancient Greeks. Interesting enough, two gods are overlooking this assembly of men. We see on the left, Apollo, the god of truth, music, and poetry, and on the right, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and reason. In the center, under the arches, again, notice the realistic use of perspective. We see Plato, who is pointing up to, for his ideal forms, and Aristotle who, Aristotle, who is pointing down. He was more concerned with the forms on this earth. Um, many people claim that Plato is actually made to look like Leonardo da Vinci, one of the other great artists of the time. On the steps, you see spra the sprawled figure, that's Socrates, and then we have other great Greek and Roman thinkers. On the lower left, you have Pythagoras. Remember the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared? He is here. Ptolemy, who was a Roman math geographer, astronomer, he is holding a, a globe on the far right. Euclid, who was the Greek father of geometry, he is on the right with the slate and the compass. And then we see other great thinkers of the time. Interestingly enough, 
Again, Raphael also put some of the great thinkers of his time within it. And I've already mentioned that many people claim that Plato is actually painted as Leonardo. And then the figure in the foreground on the left, kind of like leaning down, drawing, that is actually supposed to be, that is Herodotus, which is a Greek philosopher, but he's actually shown in the image of Michelangelo. And then Raphael actually put himself within the work. If you look on the far right, we see Ptolemy um, holding the globe. Look directly to his right, where you see this little face peeking out, looking out at the art, at the crowd. That's actually Raphael. And so what he's doing within this work is he's showing the greatness of the Greek thinkers. This is looking at reason. And remember, this is within the Vatican. It's within the seat of the church. Interestingly enough, directly across from this is that we see the, the fresco here. And this is the Disputation of the Holy Sacrament. That's the traditional name for what is really an adoration of the sacrament, meaning the central part of the church. And so we see here within this image is that it's the church being celebrated. Now think, these two frescoes are directly across from each other in the room reminding the people within the room to find that balance between faith and reason. Again, we have Michelangelo at this time. Um, I didn't put his image of the David in here, but we've already looked at it. Um, his David, compared to Donatello's David, shows us the ideal of the High Renaissance, of those idealized forms. Michelangelo's David is from 1501 to 1504, and it's marble, and it's over about 13 feet tall. Again, remember it was intended to be on top of the Florence Cathedral, but when the powers that be saw it, decided it was too beautiful to be there, so it was placed in the courtyard, um, the Palazzo Vecchio, and now it's inside in the Academia. But again, we see this idealized form. Unlike the Greek forms, who we wouldn't know who this individual is, we clearly know it's David but we see this balance, this symmetry in the idealized form. Um, in 1505, Pope Julius II commissioned Michelangelo to finish the Sistine Chapel that Pope Sistus IV had started. Michelangelo was actually not happy about this. Um, however, he did continue the work on it. And then the final work that we're going to look at today, um, this one's very important. It's not in your textbook, but more than any other work, this one almost sums up all of the ideals of the Renaissance. This was painted by Hans Holbein the Younger, H-A-N-S, H-O-L-B-E-I-N, the Younger. Um, he was German, and he became very well known for his portrait work. He was friends with the Dutch humanist Erasmus, and Erasmus is actually the one who gave him letters of introduction to the English court. Holbein, in 1536, became the court painter to Henry VIII, and many of his portraits of Henry VIII became very popular. Um, he was also very popular because he tended to make the sitters look very dignified, and this was good. We all know the stories of Henry VIII's temperament, so you probably did not want to make him angry. However, Henry VIII is not in the image that we're seeing here. This is the Ambassadors of 1533, and it's an oil on oak. And this is often used as an example to show the ideals of the Renaissance, of faith and reason. So what we see here is the picture memorializes two wealthy, educated, and powerful young men. On the left is Jean de Deventville, age 29, and he is the French ambassador to England. On the right is his friend, um, also 25, or he's 25, and he's the Bishop of Lavore. And so what we see here is we literally see one man representing the state on the left and a man representing the church on the right. And then on the table between them, this was traditionally shown, um, learned men with books and instruments of their time. However, these instruments all go to these Renaissance ideals. You've heard the term a Renaissance man. Well, the idea was that in the Renaissance, you wouldn't have just one specialization, but that you would be well-educated and well-versed in a variety of things. And we see this in the objects on the, on the table. On the upper table, we can see a celestial globe. This means the heavens and the stars showing exploration. We see a sundial, 
um, a portable sundial, and then various other instruments used for understanding the heavens and measuring time. On the lower shelf, we see a lute. You can see that's the stringed instrument. There's a case of flutes, a hymn book, a book of arithmetic, and a terrestrial globe. Terrestrial globe meaning land, showing exploration, and interesting enough, the globe is actually set so that Rome is at the center of the world. And now within these tools, we see all the tools of the Renaissance. In fact, every symbol of the seven liberal arts is within this painting. Additionally, we can see their wealth. We can see their clothing, how they're rich and luxurious. Even the bishop's clothing pay attention to the thick fabric of the, of the robe. Also, in the background, the curtain that's hanging, very rich. Again, green a color meant to represent wealth. But look at the detailed fabric. This would be very expensive. Look at the inlaid marble floor. Again, expensive. And even the rug that all the objects are sitting on. This, again, is supposed to show exploration and trade. However, there are some darker sides within this image. When we look at this, the two textbooks, the two books, one is a book of hymns. However, it's actually open to a hymn that was written by Martin Luther, so showing us the discord, the disharmony within the church. And then the other book is actually a textbook, and it's a textbook of arithmetic mathematics for merchants, meaning looking at, again, that rising middle class, the working class. And this was printed, this book was printed on a printing press. This was a major invention, which made textbooks much cheaper and more accessible for many, many people. Before this time, texts all had to be handwritten, so they were very expensive and very rare. Also showing disharmony, literally, the lute, if you can see close enough, it actually has broken strings, meaning it can't be played, and it's supposed to represent possibly the disharmony between the church and state. And then look up in the upper left-hand corner. Can you tell what that object is? It's actually a crucifix, and it's mostly covered up by this large curtain, this large drape, symbolizing the ideals of the Renaissance as covering up the church. And then probably the most notable and famous of these symbols is, in the, is on the bottom. And if you look at it from one angle, you might be like, well, what's this smudge? But this is actually what's called an anamorphic skull. And it's meant to be seen from one perspective. And the perspective is coming from the lower right. So kind of turn your computer screen, and this skull should flatten out. And so you can tell what it is. Well, why did Holbein put this in here? Was he just kind of like, hey, look at my technical skill. Look how skilled I am. No, this is actually what's called a memento, a memento mori. And it's a reminder of death, because skulls symbolize death. And so this idea is that even with all of these tools, even with the changing role of man um, in these advancements, both scientifically, technology, exploration, um, that we are all human and that death is the great equalizer and that death will come for us all. And in death, we are all equal. And so that's why he adds this to the work. So it seems to be a work celebrating the Renaissance and the ideals, yet at the same time, it also has many, many warnings about the dangers um, of this scientific technological exploration, the move away from the church. And so you can see within this how this role of man has changed from the time of ancient Greece up and through the Renaissance.